the herd watcher. Mm -hmm. So this is how we do it. I'm going to go through 14 questions. I'm going to ask you guys these questions, and then what we'll do is we'll bring in a few people at a time, and you guys tell me what you think. And the way we're going to evaluate the work of art is, let's say the first question is structure. And so the question basically is, do you feel that the artwork has a solid composition, a solid design, a solid sense of order, or do you think it doesn't? You know, And if you do think it does, then we would say yes. Or if you don't, you would say no, or you would say kind of. Okay, mm -hmm. and then from there, we would find a micro uh, impression. And so you would say, okay, if, it's, if you say yes, then, well, is it a high yes, a low yes, a middle yes? And then we subscribe a number to it. And at the end, we tally it up, we divide it, and, um, and we come out with a percentage. And that becomes the score of the work of art itself. Now, what this doesn't take into consideration is, do you like it or do you not? Because that's the most important question, okay? But let's say, as a collector, you might have, to say, five images that you, you, you really, really love, you really like, but you can only buy one. The question then is, like, which one do you buy, right? Mm -hmm. And so then you might go and use a system like this to kind of help evaluate which might be a, uh, a better buy, even though you like them all, okay? Normally, collecting is a very emotional kind of thing. It's very subjective. Mm -hmm. and so this is an attempt to kind of bring in the other half of the brain, so to speak, and have both yes. subjective and objective criteria. Y exactly. So the 14 um, character, uh, characteristics that we're going to go through are qualities. Okay. They're go some are going to be what I call head or like the analytical aspect of a work of art. The other part's the heart which is more of that emotional connection that someone has with a work of art. And then there's the hand, which is basically like your skills, your voices, the things that are unique to you in that way. And so I break it up into those three different uh, categories. All right, so the first question that we're going to ask is uh, structure. Does the image have a solid structure, sense of design, or order? Or do you feel that it's unplanned and kind of random ray is that yeah okay Ray. what would you say yes kind or no yes it definitely has a structure i would give it an eight or a nine okay cool so which one uh oh <laughs> no, I, I think it's <laughs> a nine. perfect the way it keeps you in there the way the hands are facing um and it keeps you revolving around that horse mm -hmm. I, mean, it, I, I really like it yeah me too um James, what would you say? Uh, definitely has a sense of planning, uh, and I can I see that easily. Is structure another word for composition? Yep, composition, a sense of design. Yeah, uh, I'd give yeah. it. A, you give it a what? Eight. An eight. Cool. Beautiful. So what I want you guys to do is just write uh, that number down. Um, and um, I'm going to give it a, a number nine. I think the sense of structure and design is, is, is very high. The second question that I'm going to ask is saturation. Now, saturation is um, contro uh, control of color. Do you feel that the artist has a sense of uh, a, a control over their palette, a control over um, the colors that's being used, or do you feel like they're just kind of squeezing the, the paint out of the tube and putting it on and it's just kind of, you know, a happy, a happy mess. Um, or do you feel that the artist is being deliberate and mixing and controlling the, the color patterns and the use of the, uh, the color? So, uh, Greg, what would you say? I say uh, kind of with a five. When I first saw it, I thought it was a black and white and I don't see much color, especially the sky is very white yeah. to me. Um, so I say kind of five. Okay. Now let me ask you guys a question on this. Um, who've, who've seen this painting in person. Yeah. I, is this an accurate or close representation of it or what, or is it more contrasty? I think, I think it's more contrasty. It's pretty washed out. Yeah. The, the, the original painting is? No. No, this reproduction. Yeah. Yeah. That's, the uh, original painting has a lot of very subtle tonage and it's it's beautiful from a tonage perspective 
And it's that, definitely high, high consideration on the way he's blended his colors. It's very, very nice. Plus, I'm colorblind, so uh, that's a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, that makes, that, uh, <laughs> Sorry, Victor. <laughs> that's, that's one thing I've noticed about um, photographs of paintings is that they uh, that the colors don't don't turn out to be as vivid and very mm -hmm. often a photograph looks washed out so uh, well, particularly uh, in a painting like this where the color is yeah. very subtle yeah more, uh, more yeah. tonalist paintings are uh, yeah, and you can tell the color still I mean it wasn't haphazardly chosen it's very no, not so at all me. I would score it a nine. You'd score it a nine? Okay, cool. I would, I would. I'm not colorblind. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. So write your number down. I'm going to give it a number seven. Um, I, 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 li I like the color. I think he is absolutely, uh, he's in control of his color. Um, especially when you're starting to work <clears throat> in a palette of grays like that, right? I mean, you, you mm -hmm. color... You have to know what you're doing. Um, unless I saw other works of his, I would not think that color was his strong suit. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it probably was important, but in the overall, it wasn't the most important thing. It wasn't like Van Gogh, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I would say, yes, absolutely. He's, he's in control, but I would put it at a low a low yes and so i would give it a seven um so we're kind of like in that you know from five to nine <laughs> but i would love to see this painting in person victor i i think i would actually rate it a step higher than you did i would rate mm -hmm. it at an eight How dare you <laughs> the, the, the re reason is um you know what this is is a it, it's a love flute it's a courting flute so he's mm. practicing uh you know in order to uh court his sweetheart and I think the artist was trying to uh, to give a very peaceful um, uh, look to it by using the more muted colors um, so I'm, I'm thinking that the use of color that he has in there is very deliberate and I think personally I think he did a good job I agree. Mike I didn't have you pegged for a romantic yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is very I would love to see this in person too, because I'm guessing, yeah. I don't know if this is part of it, of color, but the shading, I'm drawn to the sun in the back, and I'd, I'd love to see that, kind of the, the ray, kind of the warmth mm -hmm. of that. But, um, you know, the shading and the lighting, I'm sure in person is much more uh, powerful than what we're seeing here. And Don, that might be one of the characteristics we get to next, right? Yeah, is that, did I jump ahead? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we're going to get in shading in a second. Um, the we missed the number two one, uh, which is subject. Um, so we're going to go back one. But uh, so my question then for you is, does it have a clear subject, point of focus? Um, when you look at it, do you have a sense of, oh, that's what I'm supposed to be looking at? Or do you, f are you unsure? Are you, are you unsure of what you're looking at or where you're supposed to look or where you're supposed to go? And so um, what would you guys say? The subject is pretty obvious. Oh, he nailed that one. Yeah, so that's a nine. <laughs> yeah, I would I would rate it nine too. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, Seth, you were saying that he was uh, an illustrator, right? And and then he became a fine artist. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, um, so his need to be able to communicate uh, clearly is obviously a strong suit of his, especially visually. Um, okay, so next question. The color was the next one, right? Which we already did. Yep. And uh, silhouette. Silhouette's a great question because what it's talking about is a foreground background relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that the image is a light image on a dark background? Is it a dark background? I mean, dark foreground on a on a, on a light background, is that part of the image cared for? And there's a reason for wh why this is important. Um, it's called carrying power. So when you walk into a gallery, you walk into your home, you, you see a painting across the room, it should be able to read from across the room. And so the person who's composing the artwork 
needs to be mindful of what is the macro experience and then which attracts the person from across the room. And then when they come and stand in front of it, then you get into your micro experience and you compose at that more fine tuned level. So at a macro, does it work in terms of silhouetting? Yeah, I think so. Seth, what would you say? Um, I think it succeeds to a certain extent. Um, that bright area that Ryan was talking about that's behind the figure, mm -hmm. I think that helps silhouette the figure itself, literally. But I'm not sure the sky does it as effectively. And again, you're not seeing all the shades of gray in that sky. But well, well, you know, it's, it's kind of overall a very light painting to begin with. And uh, like Mike was alluding to, it's, a, it's kind of a mood, tonal kind of piece. Well, let me, let me stop you there for a second. That's getting into the shade and the values. That you're, you're talking more now in the micro um, right. management of values. We're, we want to stay on the macro of the values, the light, the dark. So, like, for example, so, you do uh – -huh, go on. So you're saying from across the room. Yes, what, yeah. What does it look like? And I would say it's not going to be the one that's going to first attract your eye because of the subtlety in it. But I think it's one that draws you in the closer you get. Beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, so what number would you give it? Uh, probably seven. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I agree. I'm going to go a little higher than seven. Um, and the reason why is because I want to. No. Um, the reason why is because I love the dark figure on that light background, but as you descend, it then re it changes to a light figure on a dark background. And so he's shifting, you know, mm -hmm. the relationships between the two. And then ultimately, you you go back and then you see the dark figures of the horse on the light background. Love this right here. And obviously that little horse head in the back becomes yeah. important. The white. Yeah. And, and Don, where mm -hmm. that is, is not the halfway point. Is it close to where the rule of thirds would be, where that transition takes place? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the rule of thirds is something that is banished from um, conversation. <laughs> <laughs> if we have time, I, I'll, I, I prepared a little bit extra for you guys that we can go in and actually look at how what's going on in, in terms of the, the construction of it. But, um, but yeah, all of those things that you're looking at are absolutely important and strategically placed. Um, but we won't, we won't say that name, the rule of nothing. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, uh, so okay, so I gave it an eight. You guys give it your, your number. Yep. Um, okay, so that was silhouette. Now we get into shade. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually go to the next slide here and get rid of the value. I mean, get rid of all the color oh. just so we can look at the black oh. and white. That's a good idea. So when you are, are actually studying artwork, a great thing to do is to actually get rid of all the color. Uh, because a lot of time color will distract you from looking at really what's going on in a work of art. And so, um, so once we remove it, the question here is, is he planning his values in a way that moves you through the image? And more importantly, does everything that you look at have its own identity? That is not blurring into something else and you can't tell where one edge starts and where one edge ends. And, uh, and so, Ryan, what would you say as you look into this? Yeah, image? I'm looking at it. I, obviously, I see the big contrast between the, the front and the, the landscape and the, mm -hmm. and the light in the back. So there's a pretty big delineation between the black and white. But the rest of it, to me, kind of feels kind of a, a gray, right? I, mm -hmm. I like it. it's consistent, but I don't see literally if it's, you know, black or white, like a big um, distinction between the two. The white horse obviously helps, but yeah, the biggest distinction I see is between the the um, the sky in the back and then the front piece, right? So that'd be the black white that I'd see, but I, I'd say a six or a seven on that rating. Okay. Hey, Don, how about asking Lynn Henderson, our resident photographer, about the Ansel Adams 11-point scale on this? <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, Lynn, what would you say? 
Well, I've just kind of been holding back. We're not sure how to jump in there either. Um, I can't help but look at these as I look at photography. Mm -hmm. the, the thing that bothers me the most about the image is that what we would call a blown out sky. And it's, to me, it's very distracting. It's, um, but as far as the black and white and the, the Ansel Adams, there's not a strong tonal value. He, he, I don't think he's, you know, there's the 11 zones from black to white. Um, he's kind of kept it all in the mid, mid range. And that's not bad. If that was his intent, um, maybe he, he wanted a soft, sun setting, uh, even light down with all the figures. So what are you asking me? What I would grade it for, the, uh, for as far as... In, in terms of the values, the relationships between lights and darks and... Um, I'd, say, I'd say a six. A six? Beautiful. And again, um, we may judge this a little off. It, it, would be, it may be different when, if we were looking at it in person to really see what the choice is that, that the artist was making. Um, the image here might just be a little too blurry or a little too, um, um, washed out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because like you but said, if, with that blown out sky, I absolutely agree with you. And that would be someone at this caliber wouldn't be making a mistake like that. Right. What Lynn's saying is the, the values are generally in a fairly narrow range in most yeah. of this picture. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and uh, oh, that's to maintain it, that range. Now the question then is is why is it because there's a lack of um, knowledge, or is it actually a deliberate mm -hmm. choice? How would how would we know that? We don't know. We can't talk to the artist. Oh, but you can. The whole uh, painting is a documentation of his conversation through the process. The problem is though is is this we're just getting a whisper of. You know, it's hard to tell what he intended. What, what I'm having in trying to answer your questions is mm -hmm. the quality of the photograph. And I know that's what you have to deal with. But to me, I, I go with what the Michael said, I think, earlier about the flute and the romantic uh, aspect of it. But to me, it's, it's almost twilight. Uh, mm -hmm. The horses are finally turned out. They've been worked. They're eating. He is guarding the horses, and that little ray of sun on the back, it's all twilight. And so now I start to think about the color tones and or the, mm -hmm. you know, what Lynn That's said good. in relation to the time of day that it is. And so mm -hmm. the colors are going to tend to be more, more washed out. It's, a mood. I, it's, it's setting a mood. So I, I remember the painting, and I love this painting. And one of the things that I remember going away from it is, is the color of it how soft, excuse me, how soft and pleasant and peaceful Peace. that made me be. Seth, doesn't this painting have a lot of pink in it? Yeah. There's a, there's a fair bit, yeah. It's, yeah. it's pinks and purples and yeah. of, what I would call pastel -y colors. Right, very, very yeah. nice. And so I, 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 it's, I, I guess I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very subjective first, and then I start to be trying to apply the objective things to it. Uh, based upon my original uh, interpretation of the painting, so or whatever that's. Yeah. No, I I love that, and 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 these are the questions that you want to ask because having low contrast relationships like this painting has, and you guys keep calling it tonalist, right? So it's like these really really subtle shifts of value. Um, it does something to us. If we had high contrast, it would actually cause much more energy in us, right? Because as our eye moves through, it's like, bop, boom, bop, boom, bop, boom, right? It's like loud, soft, loud, soft. But this is, it's a very different experience. And so um, if he is playing and thinking of, you know, his, his lady that he's going to go back to and, the night, you know, the, the day is coming to an end and the horses are kind of, you know, and everybody's coming to that place of, of contentment, then it wouldn't be wise to make huge contrast shifts through the, through the image. It wouldn't be the right feel. And so I would say that he's being absolutely deliberate and intentional and, and intelligent about choosing to keep his contrast very, very low. Um, now, with that said, this is where I find him to be very, uh, very smart with his choices. 
is that as your eye looks through the image, you can clearly see what everything is, even though the values are very close. And so you know where the edge of the horse is. You're not blending into the background, right? Um, <clears throat> you have all those horses in the back, and you can see where one begins, where one ends, and how the light falls and all these things. But it's so subtle, and that takes a lot of control to be able to do that. So I, I, I'm, I'll give them an eight. So let me... Once again, is this an exercise for the consumer to help them evaluate uh, the quality of the painting? Because I would buy it just because I love the message. Yeah, um, it's, but you know, it's both. It's interesting because we buy art because we have an emotional connection to it, right? Right. Um, but it's always nice to understand why you have that connection to it. At least for me, you know, it's not good enough just to know I like something. I like to know why I like it. And so the point you made at the beginning was if you were standing in a gallery and there were five paintings you liked equally, yeah. and you had an emotional response with those five pieces, this might be one way to help you decide which one you like the most out of those five pieces. Yeah. 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 And so, you know, not that you would stand there with your scorecard and your 14 point scale necessarily. Yeah. But if you were thinking back to this discussion, you would, um, you know, remember some of those things and, and try to apply them at, at the moment. Yeah. Get a... Absolutely. Absolutely. Although um, your hope is everybody's going to buy your app and have it on their phone and they can do it while they're standing in the gallery, right? Nope. Um, <laughs> I hope that they just learn to stop and begin to ask questions. Gotcha. Right. Um, Don, Don, I think that's really important. I know for Greg and I, because we're very novice at collecting still, that I go back now and look at some of the first things we purchased and wonder why was I so drawn to that one? <laughs> and to be honest, one or two, I'm not that drawn to anymore. Yep. Well, it happens a lot. People buy a work of art on emotion. Mm -hmm. You know, my father's a real estate broker, right? So there's a very difference between the people who sell residential homes versus commercial property, right? And the psychology is very, very, very different. And so a lot of people buy art like they're buying a home, right? It's an emotional thing. Mm -hmm. But I created this system because I had an art investor friend who was like, dude, if you can create some system that can help me evaluate work, because he had museums and galleries just sending him image, hey, buy this, buy this, buy this. And he needed some way of kind of helping him figure out what to buy, you know, was it good art or, or not? Mm -hmm. And so, um, and so that's kind of what got me on this to, to, to be able to break it down to these different elements. Um, but, but just being, you know, when I go to a museum, I'll go for four hours and see like three, you know, maybe five paintings, you know, mm -hmm. and you'll have like 300 people walk by you because they don't know what to look for. They don't know what to ask the painting to give. Right. And they, and they miss so much valuable stuff. And, um, and so that's what I'm hoping to get out is just encourage people to figure out ways to, to look at it and ask questions because once you do, it opens up into a whole new world. Um, okay. So Don, you got, you got a commercial real estate guy on the line here. Yeah. Oh, good. Barry, does that resonate with you? Oh, definitely. Very much so. Beautiful. Um, you know, right now we're going through this crazy time uh, and I was listening to Robert Kiyosaki talk and he said, you know, you want to, you want to protect your money. You want to protect your wealth, wealth. And so, you know, he's saying, you know, buy, buy real estate, <laughs> buy gold, silver and buy museum quality artwork, you know? And it was like, whoa, that's kind of cool. The problem is, is how do you know what a museum quality is? You know? <laughs> Is it just because somebody made an image, it's, you're supposed to buy it? You know, I remember my teacher telling me years ago, you know, you go into a museum and somebody, I mean, a museum, a gallery, and it's big, it's huge, it's bold, wow. you know, it, 
it's emotional. And, and you're like, oh my gosh, I love this thing because of the experience it gives you. And then you buy it and you take it home and you put it up and the damn thing never shuts up. It just always is screaming <laughs> all the time. And then you're just like, ah. And so you take it and you put it in the back room and then, you know, a year later it's in the back of the basement and, you know, because it wasn't really a good work of art, but it did have an impact on you. And so a system like this allows you to appreciate the impact, but then say, wait a second, are you a player or are you somebody I really should invest my time in? Right. Mm -hmm. And, 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 uh, yeah. So, which is why you'd want a soothing image like this in times like these. Mm -hmm. it, indeed. Well, I was taught by my, I was taught by my mentor, Seth, when we started buying, don't buy something because you think it's uh, necessarily for investment purposes because it, buy what you like and you want to see on your wall. Yeah. So that's, 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 if you can take, if you can take the next step and it, it matches up with all these characteristics, now, now you've doubled down. Exactly. Okay. And now you're protecting that, right? Because you're putting that money into it. You bought something that you're going to live with and love and enjoy. But when you pass it on or you, or if you do want to sell it at some point, at least you have that assurance that this is quality, you know, not just something I like, it. you know, the guys in real estate here, when you, when, when someone goes to sell a house and they're like, well, I want this much money for it because I use these nails and I, you know, painted the wall this color. And it's like, yeah, well, that's all emotional stuff, but it has nothing to do really with the value of the work. Right. And so, uh, so it's, it's, yeah, so it's interesting. So let, let's move on. I'll jot down your score for shade or values for the values in the, in the image. Artists took the time to make sure that as we move through the image, we're not getting trapped and knotted up in places. Then we appreciate the artwork. We lower the value of the work if we end up getting stuck. Because what happens is when we get stuck, our brain knows, oh, we're not supposed to be there. We're supposed to be over here. And so it, it has to use calories and energy to force ourselves out of that knot. And yeah, that causes at a subconscious level a disease, a, a disturbance. It's not peaceful. And kind of tell me what you guys are thinking in terms of, uh, does your eye flow through the image? Um, is there any place in which it gets knotted or stuck? I'll take a shot at it. Yes. I almost get stuck because... <laughs> When you come in from the left, you know, we mm -hmm. from the left to the right in, in, in our world. Yeah. And so when you come in and I get stuck on the white, the horse is white, which is what draws your eye the most. And the uh, Indian, so I get stuck on that. Plus the horse's head is back around this way. It's keeping me in the image. And then I, I notice, not immediately, but then I notice this herd of dark horses back behind. And it's a nice compliment, but it, to, to me, it's, I get stuck. So you get stuck, meaning like you keep looking here at the horse and you're not in your eye is not going back to them. Right. Okay. That's, I'm so happy you said that. Oh, because <laughs> it's such a famous painting. <laughs> There's a reason for it. Um, and it's strategic why, why that's happening. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll, I'll, I'll bring that up in a little bit. Okay. Anybody else want to take a look at this? My first thought, you know, when you first brought it up on the screen is that it pushes me left. Uh, the horses in the background, as well as the white horse's head, as well as the subject, the Indian, I'm, I'm pushed left. I have to force my eye to go back. Stuck in a circle. Right. It, it doesn't circulate me back to the main subject or create a desire to really want to see the whole thing. It, it, uh, uh, I was critical of that at first. It, it uh, distracts me. That's beautiful. My goodness, you guys are great at this. <laughs> see, for me, it's just the opposite. I think the horse's head going to the left helps balance the horses in the background. That that's that's yin and yang going on there. Yeah, I like that. yeah, I, I agree more with that. Um, 
I'll be the contrarian here. Uh, and another thing too is uh, just before coronavirus shutdown hit, I was at the booth and I was actually studying this painting. So hmm. I have wow. a very vivid memory of exactly what it looked like. And I, I, I may be a little bit on the uh, prejudice side because I love this painting so much. But what I found when I was looking at the original was that, yes, I, I started at the upper left like we normally do. I was immediately drawn to the, uh, to the Indian and his flute. Um, and then I, I kind of circulate down through the, through the horse. There's a, a spiral right there that I see that uh, kind of comes along the right mm -hmm. side of the Indian and then down curves around his head, back up his legs and then back up to his shoulders. And then that takes me over to the herd of horses. Mm -hmm. And then I kind of wander around in the horses for a little while, just looking at all the individual heads and kind of enjoying the scene and get, then get kind of drawn down into the grasses. And uh, in the original, I loved all the subtle contrasts and uh, value changes and colors in the grasses. And then I kind of get back to the, back to the horse. So I'm, I'm kind of, I kind of circulated through the entire painting and uh, really just thoroughly enjoyed looking at it. Yeah, Don, if, if I follow the exact path you suggested, uh, and I come down from the top left, I run into that landscape and it runs mm -hmm. me over to the flute. Indeed. And I'm, I can never get out of the top left corner. <clears throat> if I do force myself through that, and I go down around the horse's head and then come back up the right side. I eventually end up in a cul-de-sac where that brightest <laughs> spot is between the horses in the background and the horse in the foreground. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of stuck in that hot spot there in the middle with nowhere to go. Well, so this is the, the, um, the image itself, the, the, the Indian on the horse, he is oblivious to what's going on around him. He is so in the moment and that, that represents that, the, that, that the background <laughs> horses are not even in his, in his thoughts right now. Um, and so I think that, that he's laid it out well. The light behind the Indian brings you to him. The direction of the horse, the direction of the Indian's hands keep you in that circle, which is where the Indian is within his own world right now. And the horses are a second thought for him. That's how I read it. That, 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 so, that's spot on. So your eye does come down. It starts on that top right-hand corner. As it comes down, it hits this edge. Yeah. And it brings us to the flute, which becomes, well, obviously the most important thing in this image is the flute. And so, um, but it does keep us on to the left-hand side of the picture, right? And mm -hmm. there's a reason why, and that's because if you notice the diagonal of the back of the horse here, in the arm, the head, mm -hmm. that's called a sinister diagonal, mm. and which in the Italian means left, right? And so what happens is, is when you design something on a sinister diagonal, it brings you through the image in such a way that you do not feel that you're actually looking at the entire image. And so you feel this like, I'm trying, like, I'm not getting everything or there's some like I'm not supposed to be seeing everything or I can't see everything and so if you want to design an image that's very intimate and very quiet and very like an isolation of some sense you would want to build it on a sinister because if you build it on a baroque it brings you right in and invites you in to the painting and that's not what this painting is about this is about him drawing into his own little world right thinking of his love and 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 <clears throat> this beautiful harshness right here at first is kind of that starting of the song and then you enter into his music, right? And then this beautiful melody comes through and you're experiencing that. And, and, and so what you guys were saying, everything kind of fades away. And um, now when you look up here, what's funny is here's this little horse head popping out, yeah. right? He hears the music, but we'll get to that in a minute. Here's another head of a horse. I'm wondering if that's a little female horse. <laughs> and he's like, hey, you know. <laughs> um, and so obviously he relates to this horse because this horse has a high contrast. The head of the horse is against the background, just like his is. 
This one here is also, but because it's a white on white, it's not as important and it fades away, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you start to see these things and you bring this information in and you start asking these questions, now you have this whole buffet of knowledge. Then you can begin to interpret the piece and understand what the intention of it is, what the emotion of it is, what the artist is trying to communicate. And it becomes very, very less about interpret it the way that you want it to interpret. <laughs> and it becomes a communication. He's writing, he's doing an essay on an idea in the context of a Western image. But this could be fruit on a table, ultimately, if he designed it the same way. From, from a personal standpoint, when I look at this painting, and it jumped out fairly soon to me, and I like horses, and I, I, I'm bad about studying horses in a Western painting, but those two horses to the right, mm -hmm. I'm going to go back for a minute, the Indian in the horn and the horse sort of takes me in a circle, I think you were talking about, and then I leave that circle at the top where the horses, uh, the, the silhouette line at the top of the herd is. But then I follow across the top of the herd, and here's the two horses walking. Those, are ho those two horses are in stride. Mm -hmm. All the rest of the horses are stagnant for the most part, even the horse that's grazing. But those two horses, when, when I get around to that far right border of the painting, it, those two horses force me back into the painting. And they also create a little action in the painting for me. When those horses say, well, I wish that guy would stop with that stupid flute or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, but these horses were moving back, and that creates a, a synergy or a little action for me. That's in the fabulous. Yeah. Good. I'm good. Now, also adding to that, if we start on the left and we come through and he's playing this song, and really what the horses are representing is his thought pattern. So he's thinking, oh, I like her, and we'll be together. Right? I have to go get her, and then we'll we'll walk together, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. I, I have a confession. I just turned... I'm not a father. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I just turned the screen brightness up on my uh, computer. Uh -huh. I, I had it down on... Because I keep it on halfway for evaluating my photography. I just turned this up, and it's much better. Oh. I probably should turn mine down. <laughs> <laughs> That's the uh, awesome, awesome. So we have space. Um, we some some people are saying, okay, well, it's it's locking us over to one side. We can get to another, but it's also bringing us back. No, the fact that you can feel that is great. Now you need to ask yourself the question: is is that done on purpose? Right, and if you feel that it isn't done on purpose, well, then you know that. It, it wasn't done on purpose, right? And that's not a good thing. If it is done on purpose, then you're like, oh, okay, what is this guy doing to me, right? What is he, what is he doing? What is he trying to make me feel? What, where is he trying to lead me through this thing? And so um, I believe uh, it's done on purpose um, for many reasons. So I, I'm going to give it um, I do think real quick, the little light back here and the contrast, this harsh contrast back here. Mm. Um, again, you don't see these harsh contrasts anywhere except mm -hmm. here. And so again, it ties us to here, this long. Mm -hmm. And then, well, so when I look at this, I, I do it like I'm reading a book, right? So when I read, I see a word and I hear it in my head. And so for me, when I look at visuals, I hear sound. And so I, in my mind, it's like, ooh, do, 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 right? It's almost like he's playing the song, right? And so if, if the artist wants to elevate the artwork into more of a poetic composition or even a melodic composition, they may lay things out for our eyes to bounce through, just like a poem. A, A, B, A, A, B, B, A, or music would work. You can lay out your visual elements so that our eye moves through in certain rhythms and you can feel the, 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 the song being played. Okay. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. John, um, I think we've been through about half of the 14 points and we're 
getting short on time. Uh, we got 12 o'clock, right? Yep. All right. So the next one, I promise, will only take about 45 seconds. We never scored it. Oh, go ahead and score it. Write it down. I'm going to give it a, for space, a nine right? for space. I'm going to yeah. give it a nine for space. Yeah, um, I did. Too. Seven. Definitely a nine. Um, <laughs> signature. Sometimes you look at a beautiful painting and then they sign their picture and it takes up a third of the painting. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> sometimes it's a black signature on a snow scene. Um, <laughs> and so you, you want to be able to ask yourself, did the artist have an intelligent approach to their signature and does it feel that it's part of the composition? Where is it signed? Okay. Oh, I see the signature. Down on the right corner. The Happy Hendersons. That's what I'm going to call you guys for now. <laughs> I'm telling you not to say it. I was going to say Trump didn't sign it, obviously. <laughs> um, It'd be golden. I don't. I don't even. I don't even see. Right, right here. It, yeah, it's there, but that's a great think, thing, yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah. he's now. Totally he's right. using a value that's very, very close to that area, so yeah. that your eye goes through it. You know, um, he doesn't want the signature to violate the painting. I like that. Okay. And yeah. your eye can go around it. So I've, I'm going to give him a nine. I think he did a great job on it. Mm -hmm. And I like the humility that he's not, that he's bringing to it. Right. Mm -hmm. Like let the painting be the signature, not, not my, my name. Um, number, uh, the next one is story. Story. Yeah. And so what story is, is you're going to evaluate it for two things. One, does it have a distinct feeling or mood? And or is there a clear narrative? Now, not all art needs to have a clear narrative. So the way that I, when I'm training an artist, I'm like, okay, you got to figure out what it is that you want someone to feel. And Norman Rockwell said that one of the secrets to his success was that he could make you feel more than one feeling in an image. Okay. Mm -hmm. So therefore, once you feel one thing, for example, at the sky, it's very, very blank. But over the horses, there's a movement of energy, right? Those are two different feelings. And the transition between them is your story. It's, it's that causing someone to move from one, let's say, charge or feeling or state of consciousness into another, it, then, it turn, the, then the artwork becomes alive because it actually moves you to time. It, it does something in you. It's just not a frozen thing that you're looking at. Um, and so this is what I mean by story. Is there a, a clear, distinct feeling that we're supposed to feel or a combination of feelings that we're being led through? And if there isn't, then we de-appreciate the art. And if there is, we appreciate it. Who would like to take a stab at this one? It's definitely a story. I mean, you know, if that's what it's all about is, is his uh, isolation and his, and his thought within the recorder that he's playing, the flute. Yeah. I definitely see a story. So I'm gonna, a yeah, I think this is another easy one. Um, unless anybody would like to say anything else okay so story number nine now <clears throat> soul soul is a very interesting um one the way i articulate soul in an image is this is the artist more consumed with getting all the details and doing the artwork by the book in terms of representing the nouns in the image or are they taking at least some time to appreciate the verb or the energy or the or the perception of what they're looking at not just rendering what they're looking at and so this is when an artwork goes from say copying a model to interpreting the muse even though everything in the studio is exactly the same it's the perception it's the way the artist approaches the canvas and so do you feel that that they're more that he's focused on the energy and the moment and the essence of of what's happening 
artist? Yeah. yeah. I don't understand the question again. Could you? Okay. Uh, is, is this one where um, if you're rendering a photograph and it was obvious you were just rendering a photograph, that that would be part of this one? Yeah. Uh, or even like, let's say people who do a portrait, right? And they think if I can just capture the eyeballs, teeth and nose and ears just right, I captured the person. Right. Mm -hmm. You're a bunch, um, you're all from the South, right? Yeah. So no. in the, oh, okay. Most of y'all are from the South. So in the South, we have this beautiful saying, I say we because I spent a decade in, this, in, in Georgia. Um, I, we have this beautiful saying, spit an image, right? And so spit an image comes from spirit and image. And so when we say, oh, that guy, that, that, that boy is in the spit and image of his grandfather, mm -hmm. it not only means that he looks like the grandfather, like he has the same ears or eyebrows, but the way he walks and the way he talks mm -hmm. and his cadence and his, his rhythms and his, it's that spirit of the boy reminds us of the grandfather. And so is the artist caring not only about the image, the likeness of what he's looking at, but also the spirit, the energy, the soul, the essence, the cadence. What lies beneath the image. What lies beneath the image, yeah. Um, we, in photography, we call this an environmental portrait because it tells us, of, not only captures the person, but it tells us about the person. Okay, explain a little more. Um, as opposed to just their face and the, the body, it puts them in the setting that shows what their life is about. What, uh, so it's envi they're envi they are in their environment, but it's a portrait about them. Hmm. I think so, what's going on inside of you comes out through your art, then you've captured the soul. But if you're just seeing the external, a person could be smiling but burning up inside. If you can capture that in a painting, then yeah, you, you've done that. It, 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 exactly. And so, like, if we're going to do a painting of a person and we want them to smile, I always tell them uh, when I'm working with an artist, a portrait artist, I'm like, don't worry about the person smiling. You have to make the painting smile. And so you compose the painting to smile mm -hmm. because when you're across the room, it needs to smile. They're not going to see the smile on the face if they're across the room. It's too small, right? So the painting has to smile. And how do you do that? And you have to design it for that. And so you're, you're concerning yourself with the subject, but you're going beyond the subject. And so um, it's very hard to articulate it, uh, except that I always just say the energy of the piece. If you th look at a Van Gogh, he's not just painting clouds. He's painting movement, right? You look at a Degas, he's not painting dancers. He's painting the dance when you begin to look up at it, okay? So is he concerned more with just the horse and the guy and, and that, or is he really communicating something that's invisible? With, is that what with, he's really with this artist, all of his works have a element of a mystical feel mm. to them for me. And I think he captures that romance and that mystical feel of not just the Indian being uh, in love thinking about his girlfriend, but there's also a romantic piece of it about the time and place that he is plant, uh, painting. It's, it's also the emotional capture of when an Indian would actually sit alone with a herd of horses, in my mind. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking that too, just in terms of all the other Ken Riley works. Yeah. And I've seen. I like this one. I think it has soul and you get the, you know, you get his feel and, and the isolation, but in terms of, yeah, that, you know, an iconic Ken Riley, I think some of his other ones have more energy and, and essence. And I don't know if you're supposed to bring in other works of the artist compared to just this one, but I don't think it ranks as highly as, as some of his other ones, but I do think this piece on its own has, has soul. So I give it an eight or so. Yeah, that's where I'm about. I'm about maybe an eight. I might even go at a seven. Um, uh, but the answer from my perspective is yes. Uh, I'm actually going to give him a seven. <clears throat> uh, no, I'm going to give him an eight because as I think about it a little bit more. Um, Ryan, you brought up a great thing, and that's if we do this once on one painting, you get a, an idea of the painting. What's beautiful is when we have a group of people and we at the end 
combine all the scores and we get a, a collective assessment, then it becomes very clear like, oh, this is where the collective consciousness of this work is. Right. Now, if you want to evaluate the artist, do 10 of his paintings like this, and then you start to see patterns. Oh, he's very, very strong in this, 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 weak in this, this and that, right? And if it's repeated over and over, now you have it, you, you begin to really lay out who the artist is. Um, hey, Don, Don, this is Greg. So um, during this entire exercise, I've been um, listening to the comments of individuals trying to discern whether it was head knowledge or emotion or heart um, and hand. And it's interesting, in my opinion, most of the comments were uh, emotional. Heart. Would you say that? Well, we right now we're in the emotional part of the questions. The first section is all head. Uh, composition, okay. knowledge, yeah. color, okay. those things that you're planning, controlling. But when we start to talk about story, soul, soul. spacing, which is what we're going to get into now, sway, these are all things that are, you, you kind of, <laughs> I, w I was okay. teaching uh, these young kids and um, uh, it was in an inner city school. And, uh, and so I put some Miles Davis on, right? And it was funny, these little, these little kids, they were like third, fourth grade, uh, they were fourth grade, I guess. They're like, ooh, what's this, right? And I'm like, just go home and ask your granddaddy what this is, right? But they liked it. And I said, um, I'm going to ask you guys a question. Who here feels this music? And uh, I mean, who here likes this music? And, and everybody raised their hand, right? And, uh, and then I said, well, who here feels this music? And <laughs> a bunch of little, the little black kids were like, yeah. And a little white boy's like, what, what do you mean by that? And we're like, ah, well, we, you know. <laughs> so yeah, there, there is that, you know, this is the part where we're feeling the work and, and, and dancing with the painting, you know. And that's more natural to some people, and it's more natural to be more analytical for others, right? A great artist knows how to dance between the knowledge and, 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 the, and the emotion. Wow. Wow. So in terms of spacing, space, what was that? that George, George Carlson. It just made me think of George Carlson when you said that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, who's George Carlson? I'll, I'll school you later, Don. Okay, very well. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so now we want to get into spacing real quick. So spacing is about rhythm. Are there patterns and rhythms that are moving through the image? Do you feel the repetition of things? Okay. And so um, who would like to take a stab at this one? Mm. Not sure about that. So is there a clear rhythm, rhyme, pattern, or pulse uh, embedded in the space, shapes, and lines? Yes. Lower the value when <clears throat> the, the space and lines don't have that sense of pattern and rhythm and they feel random and just arbitrary. Oh, they don't feel arbitrary. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, to me? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Lynn. I see them in the sagebrush, the grass. I see the, the round shapes and then in the horses in the back. So I, I feel repetition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there's a good sense of spacing. I'm not sure. What would you guys there. grade it at? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Up there where those horses were, the bear I was talking about before. Mm -hmm. The more I look at it, starting from the far right edge, I do see some, some rhythm in the legs of those yep. two horses and then carrying over to the ones that are a little further back and then the ones you were pointing to before that are silhouetted against the sky. Yep. There is some uh, linearity or, or rhythm to that. You're feeling that more. rhythm coming through. Mm. Yep. Oh, wow, I mean, yeah. Da, 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 whatever, right? I'm not a singer, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm in quarantine, so I'm singing all the time. Uh, and then on a, mic on a microcosm, um, mm -hmm. I see that a little bit in each one of those little bushes with the brush strokes. If you really zoomed in on them, you know, it's like the flute notes. It's, you know, uh, a sharp and a, and a flat and a sharp and a flat. And, um, you know, there's, there's some rhythm in each one of those little bushes almost. And yep. there's order. There's order. Yep. 
There's, Beautiful. I see a I see a wave pattern in the uh, in the sagebrush too. Mm-hmm. Kind of going diagonally uh, again, a sinister diagonal right. there along the waves. All right, I'm. I, I, let me bring something in my little gift that I was going to do later, but I'm going to just bring it in right now so you guys can take a look at it before we grade rhythm. Okay. Um, so. I broke down this image in a couple different ways. And since we're talking about the rhythm right now, I'm just gonna go to the curves because it was brought up a couple times. And so um, if I have a couple slides here. So if we look at this curve that's on the top, can you guys see the yeah. image? Yeah. 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 You see that curve here? Right. Yeah. It, it now, it connects us from the ear of the, wow. of, the, of the guy all the way through the horses to the back of that horse. Wow. Now, if we take that specific curve and just begin to duplicate it, all of a sudden, it's connecting the horses from here, Holy over cow. here, over there. It's the yeah. same exact curve. It creates the back of these horses. It just keeps going on and on. If we go and we bring it down, we uh, bring it, it brings us to the bottom of the horse's bellies up through here. Where, look at where their feet are planted on there. The bottom of the horse belly here. Um, through here, all of these things, right? And then if we flip it, all of us, the same exact curve, you can begin to see that, look at the value shifts in the, in the foliage down here, right? Also, his belt, um, if, we, if I turn it off, you see how his belt is curved, like where his belt yeah, on his pants? Yeah. But that's exactly the same curve as, mm -hmm. as all these other things that are going on, okay? And then, this wow. is boom, right. So this is the thing when I, I this is what I first saw. I was like, whoa, it's almost like look at the pattern in the, the, the different values and how what? he's planning all that out. And you turn and that the out. Lasso, um, yes. The rope coming from the Indian and up to the horse, that's one defining thing that points us right to the Indian. Exactly. That becomes yeah. now that becomes what we call the the dominant vertical in the image. Yeah. And so through his, the top of the belt here is a dominant horizontal and it comes to the bottom of the feet. We have through the, through the flute, the dominant diagonal, and it all, it converges into his ear. And then you have this beautiful wow. curve, just that's the music. Wow. Playing through, right? And so it, it's really about not him actually playing, but about him hearing the sound of nature that he's now playing, right? And how it's, reverberating through so when when your eye catches these nuances and all of a sudden this thing pops in you're mm -hmm. just like whoa you know yeah, no kidding. <laughs> and so um that's great i'm in the stock market and that's they'd be called technical analysis on stock <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, really, I really like that the yeah. connection uh-huh yeah and so if you go through here uh oh, since we're here already, if we take that flute, which is really yeah. the strong diagonal, and we multiply that all the way through, you can see how many deliberate points in the image he shifted things, like the bottom of the, the horse's the head, horse's all these things. Now, if we take that same diagonal and we flip it the other way, now we have it on the sinister, and you see how much is constructed along yeah. those ways, right? Then if we take it and we knock it 90 degrees, now we find how much more is being constructed. The back of this horse here, the, 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 the horse, the feet coming up through, the head. And so all this stuff is intentional and deliberate. And then if we take that same angle and we flip it the other way, I mean, the bottom of the horse, the, the, the ears, the nose, the tail, the feet, all, you know, his body, his head is constructed mm -hmm. on there. So much stuff. Wow. And and that's why we feel the harmony, the the unity, the the order that's there because he's just like if you're going to paint, you don't want to use every color in the rainbow. Right. A master composer doesn't want to use every line in a circle, which is you know let's say 360 lines, right? They'll limit it to about 5 to 8 line directions. And then they compose their entire work that way. And that's why it just feels like it vibrates in a certain way that's, that makes it museum quality. It's like, oh, 
you know, and, and artists who don't work this way will use 20, 30, 50, hundred different <laughs> angles and your eyes just bouncing all over the place and you don't know why it doesn't feel right. And this is, this is one of the reasons why. There's no order. Because there's no order and, and there's no limit to it. You know, it's just, they're just well, doing I whatever they're doing. That category. Amazing. So and Don, Joyce is asking me, um, you know, is he thinking about all those lines when he's starting it and composing it and doing a preliminary drawing perhaps or whatever? For an artist that the capability he's at and that where he would have been in his career at that it's point, having been an illustrator, it's pretty intuitive, is it not? Um, at his age, I would probably say a lot of it's intuitive. Um, but this was a hard image to actually break down in terms of composition because he's so advanced that it was a little bit of a tricky one to get. Right. And so like this would not be an image I would give to a person who was just starting out in composition to try to analyze because it was really, uh, let me just go back and show it to you. It was really complicated, but I figured it out and it all comes back to the, the flute. So it, what happens here is this, if we take that flute, right. And, um, and we extend it from the bottom corner all the way up, it gives us this rectangle. And you can see how the horse is being constructed within it. And then we multiply it over here. And now we have, we have it over here. Um, then we can come in with inside these spaces, break down what we call a rebated square. You can see how he's getting locked in, the horses, the V in the horses here. Um, how the horses over here are looking this way, but the ones over here are moving in this direction. Um, and so th th this is the geometry that's underneath the painting um now wow. when he's sketching and designing it uh when he's sketching it he's doing a lot of this wow. intuitively but then he's going to come back and refine it right because if you don't refine it then then you have a good work of art but you won't have a great work of art and so um you know it, even even after years and years you're not going to be that precise um when you're, trying so to teach, when you're trying to teach this to your students, you're not starting with anything that's complicated, but you're trying to give them the building blocks to be able to work up to doing this sophisticated a level of composition and start having it be somewhat intuitive so it's not paralysis by analysis by paralysis, right? Yeah, you always start with that emotional aspect so you always start with a sketch right so let's say oh i want to draw a horse here you know drinking out of the water and um you know and so you might say okay here's the river and there's a guy on the horse you know and maybe he's looking over the mountain and there's something that's coming at him over here it might be an animal it might be some Indians, it might be something right so here then i would say okay this is a very strong diagonal so is it about yeah. the horse drinking now maybe i might not want that so maybe i want this if, I, if he's really in danger, maybe I bend the, the horse's head up and fall right into that same angle that he's looking over at this danger that's coming at him, right? And so finding this strong diagonal becomes the key to designing and composing the entire painting. So cool. just a couple more about four minutes. <laughs> so um, shape, shape is this. It's basically the relationship between positive shapes and negative shapes. A lot of artists will only focus on the positive because that, uh, can you guys see the, uh, the painting now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and, you know, they're, they're so focused on the noun and the object and the subject of what they're painting that they're not really becoming intuitive or sensitive, I should say, about the invisible parts of the work, right? And so some artists, a great artist will will care for the positive, but also craft and mold and care for that negative space. So like in this painting, when I see this, I see the shape underneath the art, uh, uh, underneath the horse. That's a, a really elegant shape. Beautiful skin. You know? And so is the artist moving through and, and caring as much for those negative spaces or shapes as he is for the positive. And so what would you guys say? Oh, yes. Yes, he's... he's yep. mm -hmm. well, yeah. 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 What were we gonna say? 
Um, yes, he is. I, I started to comment that the head is merging with the right front leg, but I don't think that matters. Okay. Oh, oh I see what you're saying. Yep. Mm -mm. All right. So I'm going to give it, um, I'm going to give it a nine because I'm, I'm, especially these horses in the back, if you look at the shape underneath their bellies mm -hmm. and how that purple's coming through, mm -hmm. it's just so beautiful the way the eye moves through there and, and, and nothing is grabbing you or harsh or, you know, um, just all beautiful shapes. Uh, the next one is Sway. This is one of my favorites. Sway is... Is there, it says, appreciate when there's a beautiful movement or motion or design um, or, or flow, right, that's been designed into the work. Um, and do you feel this sense of, a, of an arabesque, this graceful movement moving through the image, or is it kind of just stuck and frozen? I do with the horses in, in the back, right, but... Um, again, not overall, but I think that was deliberate. That's a new term for me, but that diagonal, um, the sinister diagonal, right? So it's almost like it's by design that it's, there isn't much sway, I would say, right? But the upper right to me mm -hmm. has it. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and yeah. a lot of artists will do that. Like if you, when you start to look at it, especially if you look at a person contemplating, sometimes they'll have like a, a lady sitting here by a window, right? And this is very peaceful, but then behind her, this explosion of flowers is on the mantle or whatever. And it's really, it's not about the flowers. It's about she's in thought. And even though outwardly it's this quiet moment, the reality is this is going on on the inside of her, right? Or beyond her. Um, and so it's a, it's a very common way of making us feel what's going on inside of the person you're looking at. Uh, if you say yes, uh, seven, eight, or nine, is it a high yes, a middle yes, or a low net yes? Um, I'm going to give it an eight because I think there is a a beautiful – well, I'm going to give it a nine because I forgot about the <laughs> radiating um, lines in the bottom, the circles in the bottom, the bullseye. <clears throat> that was brilliant. It's radiating. All right. Now we're going to get into the last two questions. So um, – voice um, or unique approach and then we want to lower the the, the value um, when we look at a work and it seems kind of like a spin-off or like a lot of people working that style like if you put it up it really wouldn't jump out and you know and say oh that's that artist right it, you're not really sure who the artist is until you see the name so that's the kind of uh, thing we're evaluating right now what was the word? what was that what was the word, the S word? Uh, style. Style, yeah. I would give him a high number, but I'm afraid I'm being influenced by his other works as well because yeah. I walk by his work and I go, oh, that's, that's definitely Ken Riley. I mean, he definitely has a unique look and style, especially okay. versus the others in the museum, I think. But this yeah. one is a little mm -hmm. new. This, this, now, that's, that's a, a great way of evaluating the artist if we're looking over a couple paintings. But in this specific painting, do, do you still feel that same way? I do because of his softness of tone, his, his subtleness of the way that he presents his images. It's, it's still got almost a misty feel to it. Gotcha. Would anyone have a, a contradict that? I think that because I'm not familiar with him, his style is subtle. Uh, it doesn't jump out to, at me that that you know, this this is a different a different approach than any artists have that preceded him. And so, uh, in terms of style, I would probably rate him as a seven. Or eight. Okay, yeah, that, that's actually where I'm at as well. I, th I think I would rate him a little well. I, I'm not seeing a unique style so much in this one. Um, now, to be honest, this this is really the only one of his that I'm familiar with. Uh, so I'm I'm looking at it strictly on the basis of this one painting, and uh, I I don't see an awful lot unique about it. So I would you know six or seven something like that. The design is kind of 
the style is, um, uh, you know, I don't see anything that really stands out in terms of the style of how he's structured it, how, how he's painted it actually. Mm -hmm. Okay. So give them, write the number down. Okay. And then um, the next question um, on style, I'm at seven as well. Uh, so on the next question is skill. Does the artist have a clear control um, over the medium, over the artistic medium? Yep, he's got that. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm with you on that one. <laughs> so I'm, at, I'm at a number nine on that. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so what I want you guys to do, uh, we're, we're done with the, the 14 questions. So right. um, <clears throat> I want you to uh, add them up. And then you're going to divide them. I just want to verify that 126. Okay. Four. Wow. That's cool. Um, I always tell the artist that if you're not hitting an 80%, don't uh, oh. expect someone to buy your work. <laughs> I would, I would never tell anyone to buy work under 80%. Um, so when I look at this, I break it up in the head and hand. And so at 95% uh, for the head part of the artwork, okay? And that's that analytical nature of the work. And so you can see here how it's broken down. You can see here that if he wants to raise this score, he could, well, he can't now, but, you know, um, <laughs> he, he could just wor worry about maybe pushing his palette, his color a little bit more, and also playing around with that silhouette, right? Everything else is really, really well. Uh, the hard part, you can see it's fluctuating a little bit more. And so uh, with that spacing, getting more, more rhythm in there, you know, being a little more deliberate about that, um, uh, playing with that, and also the soul uh, aspect of it. But again, he's, he's, he's pretty high, you know? Um, and so that he's at a 96. So between the two here, He's a really balanced artist, head and heart, and that's rare to see. You, 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 I don't think I've ever seen one who's been so close on that. That's very cool. And then he drops down in terms of uh, in this specific painting. Uh, his skill is high, but his artistic voice is a little low. Is a little low on this specific um, uh, mm -hmm. painting. It's eighty-eight percent. Okay, give me eighty-eight percent. I had 108, which is 86. 86. Percent. Mm-hmm. James says 80. 80? Correct. That was an 80 percent? Yep. Overall. 89 overall? Man, you guys are uh, harsher than I am. I had 93 percent, so I was right there. Beautiful. I'll be added wrong. I have 107. <laughs> you really like this work. Um, <laughs> what a chill. I like this work too. <laughs> I'm high. 107 is 85%. I've got my calculator here. So. Okay. Oh, 85%? Yeah. That's really good. So really, really cool. So the museum should buy it again. <laughs> or give it to me. <laughs> What's the name of that painting? Uh, the I'll see it now. Say um, that this whole exercise has been uh, very good. Yeah, oh, uh, yeah it. it uh, as an artist? Well, it's just a just a, as an artist, but as appreciation, I think it makes me want to go and stand in front of a painting now a lot longer than I normally would. And uh, it's sort of like uh, my, Lynn and I were hiking this morning and I said, said, you know, there's so much in the woods that we just don't read. You know, we that's read it. the trees and the leaves and the bugs biting Lynn and that's about it, you know. But <laughs> there's so much there to read if you just stop and pay attention to it. And I, I appreciate your, your whole deal this morning. It is very, very good to, to look at art the way you were looking at it. I agree. And also to share art. Yes. People who aren't used to looking at it, to give them guidelines. Yes. You Wonderful. Know, Thank you so much.
put a wrapper on what we did today. And uh, I appreciated Barry's comment. Um, and if we have achieved nothing else today but opened eyes uh, a mm -hmm. little wider, then we've achieved our goal, correct? That yes. Was it. Yep. We do. We in got our, boxes over there. <laughs> in our review sessions we have with the photographers, and we try to explain to them why it's not working. And uh, of course, in a, a painter can control what they put on the paper. A photographer, sometimes it just, it's just, it's a moment. It, it, that's true. Um, but then you look at a, a what's his name, a Bersant, and he would go and compose and draw these things and then set the scene, and then he would wait for the moment to happen in his composition. Oh, you wow. <laughs> okay. Wow. Yeah. Thank you, Booth, for inviting me into your home to look at some of your art. I'm Don Victor, and I help folks identify museum quality art.